morning and welcome everybody. My name is David Blank and I'm a member of the Christian Science Church that is hosting this event this morning. Our speaker is Mark Swinney from Sandia Park, New Mexico. Uh, and Mark told me that Sandia stands for watermelon. <laughs> Mark loves God and it is the basis of everything he does. In fact, he has dedicated his life to empowering others to find spiritual healing by turning to God through prayer. He is an author, editor, and teacher, and he travels the world speaking about God and the healing power of prayer. Join me today in welcoming Mark Swinney. Well, thank you all. You saw on the, on the flyers that what we're, we're looking at is something much more than meets the eye. You saw that. Uh, I think probably a better title for our talk today might be uh, You're Substantially Spiritual. And a, just a knowledge of that can heal you. That's one of the ideas, really, we're going to be covering here today. Now, if you've never been to an event like this, a, a talk like this, please feel very much at home. It's, uh, it's nice to be able to kind of get together here on a Saturday morning. And really, we're going to be looking at some kind of deep ideas metaphysically. We're going we're gonna to go for it today if, you, if you'd like to. If, um, you know, if you really think about uh, what you heard in that uh, introduction, you know, you heard about my love for God, you heard the words Christian science. Uh, maybe you know that uh, the person who founded Christian science is a woman named Mary Baker Eddy. She lived in New England and oh, about 140 years ago, she first wrote uh, this book right here. It's called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And I think there are copies both of the Bible and of science and health on your tables there. And, you know, all through this book, she really confronts materiality, contrasts it with spirituality. And that is kind of our starting point, and it'll be our finishing point here today, too. Um, there on page 349, Right at the, at the bottom, she says something interesting. You don't have to all look it up. I'll read it to you. She says, in Christian science, substance is understood to be spirit, while the opponents of Christian science believe substance to be matter. They think matter as something and almost the only thing, and of the things which pertain to spirit as next to nothing, or is very far removed from daily experience. Christian science takes exactly the opposite view. All right, that, that contrast of substance, either material or she's saying it's spirit. Now she's capitalizing that word spirit because she's employing it as a name for God, and we'll talk about some other ones uh, today, but um, Looking at God as substance versus matter as substance is kind of our starting point. Because I tell you, most of the world, they think of, of physicality, of matter, as the whole enchilada, the whole story. That matters the whole thing. And you know what? I mean, you and I, we had impressions of matter, of physicality, right from the start. Even before we were born, even before we were born, in the womb, we might have moved our hand up to our mouth. And so impressions of the touch of matter and movement through matter, I mean, that happened even before we were born. That impression of matter is something that's so strong. I mean, think about all the different ways you and I manipulate matter every day. I mean, we might have, to get here to this lecture, we moved the steering wheel in our car. We opened and closed a door. You pick up a sandwich to eat it or maybe one of those muffins over on that table, or something like that. Think of all the different ways we manipulate and move and touch matter. And you know what? It, it, if you think about it, 
your five physical senses are telling you that matter is the whole story, that that's the whole thing. And if matter is the whole thing, we shouldn't fool ourselves and say, oh, matter is so beautiful. No, matter is the source of all suffering, and we got graveyards full of, of people who look like they were born into matter and died out of it, and that's just the whole story. You know, if you were to talk to a modern physicist, uh, he would tell you, or she would tell you, that you have never even touched matter at all. A modern physicist will tell you that. I mean, it, it feels very much like you're sitting on those chairs, isn't it? You can feel them. But actually, if you talk to a modern physicist, he'll tell you that you're only sitting 10 to the minus 8 meters above the chair. You remember when you were uh, little and you would play with magnets and you sometimes take two ends of magnets with the same polarity and remember how it's hard to get them to, to touch? On an atomic level, it's something like that. And it's impossible really for, for matter to touch, for you to touch a chair. And you know, the, the atoms in your chair, we can't even define their position either. And so, you know, it might make you wonder, is that feeling of sitting on a chair a mental impression? I mean, you're not touching it, but it sure feels like you are. I, on the way in here, I patted a dog, and it felt like I patted that dog's head. Yet, it might have been a mental impression. Now, what I have found in, in thinking these ideas through is that my world of matter is not exactly as I always expected it to be. I know that you've all had that, where your world turns out different than you thought it was. Here's an example. It's, a, it's kind of a silly example, but you'll understand it. I, I remember when I was little, I don't think I'd started school yet, but one day I lost a tooth, and um, I did what every child does here in America. I took that tooth out and put it under my pillow, and... Um, then I, that night, I'm getting ready to go to sleep. And I remember as I was lying there in bed, the tooth is under my pillow, I see my father uh, open the door of my room and look in. He didn't say anything, but he saw that I was awake. And then he just closed the door without saying anything. And, well, the next morning, I looked, and there was 25 cents under my, my pillow, and my tooth was gone. Well, that morning, I remember I was sitting on the floor in my parents' room, and my mother, she was combing her hair or something in the mirror. My dad was over on the other side, and um, I said to my mother, I said, you know, last night, before I went to sleep, I saw dad peek in the door, didn't say anything, which he normally would have said goodnight or something like that, but he closed the door, and in the morning, my my tooth was gone, but I had a, a quarter under there. And it makes me wonder if possibly the tooth fairy might be my dad. <laughs> and my mother was quiet for a second, looked at me and said, yes, yes. <laughs> now, for you watching online, if you're a little child, I'm sorry, I just broke the news. But, um, <laughs> well, I tell you this, this sounds silly, but I remember staring at the floor as I sat on it, I just, the room started to spin. My world was really changing. And I looked at my mother and I said, now wait a minute, does that mean that the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus also is dead? And she goes, mm-hmm, don't tell your brother. <laughs> well, I'm not kidding you, I just... I just was shocked. I know this sounds silly, but I just was shocked because, see, I'd been told about Santa Claus since I was little. He'd brought me presents. I'd seen him in books. I'd seen him on TV. I'd seen him at the mall. I'd even sat on his lap, or at least 10 to the minus 8 meters above his lap. <laughs> and so Santa Claus was very real to me. And as a little child, it's one of the 
biggest deals in life. And all of a sudden, it's, everything's very different. Now the things that I believed in, thought were so totally real, uh, turned out to be nothing but a relative in my family. Well, just a few months after that, I had a, another shock. Another shock that was much more significant this, than just the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus and stuff like that. Uh, there was a time where our family, they, I wasn't able to, to stay with my family. My parents couldn't take care of me, and I would live with other families. And I remember um, one day, my father, on a Monday morning, he was going to drop me off at a family's house. I was going to stay that week. And um, as he was uh, doing that, inadvertently I caught my hand in the car door when he closed it. Now, uh, he opened the door and, you know, I cried out. I could see with my own two eyes that my hand was hurt and I definitely could feel that it was hurt. About, oh, four or five months prior to this, my father had been spending time doing something I'd really never ever had seen him do. He, he, he'd been reading books. I'd never really seen him do that too much. The books he was reading were these two books. He got a Bible, and somebody else in our family had given him a copy of this book, that book, Science and Health, that I told you about. I'd see him at home reading them, and I was kind of surprised, a little puzzled, because I never saw him do this kind of thing. Yet, he began talking to me about prayer and healing and God a little bit, and I really liked when he'd tell me about these things. Well, I'll never forget standing on the grass there in front of the house uh, after my, my hand had been caught there in the door. And um, he, had, he had my hand in his. He loved me very much. And I was crying. I'm crying because my hand hurts. I'm crying because I have to live at somebody else's house. It was just a bad day. Well, I see on his face, I can tell he's praying for me. He's praying for me. I don't know how he was praying for me. I don't know what he was thinking about. But in a moment, the pain stopped completely. And my hand was not injured at all. Both hands looked exactly the same. This was way beyond the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus. Now my world really is changing. And I remember he drove away, and I started walking up the, the lawn, the grass up to this house, and I thought, boy, this, the, the, the rules of matter, they, they just don't work the way I had been taught they should work. I'd been taught by my five physical senses that something like a car door shutting on a hand is going to cause injury, injury that is going to be, it'd take a long time to get back to normal. But then all of a sudden, like the snap of a finger, it's, it's complete, my hand is completely healed. And so I remember being so quiet, but so curious about what happened. I knew my world was very different. The substance that made up hands, car doors, the grass I'm walking on, all felt like very strong impressions, yet there was an even stronger impression all of a sudden, a, an impression of, of the presence and somehow the power of God. I didn't know what it was, but I, I certainly wanted to know so much more. Now, in this book, Science and Health, that I've been telling you about, Mary Baker Eddy, she talks a lot about this. Most of the ideas I'm going to talk with you about today, they came from reading the Bible and from, from this book, Science and Health. She got all of her ideas from, from the Bible. And she talks quite a bit about the nature of God, and that's helpful in thinking through this question of what is real substance. Another name that she uses for God in this book is mind, M-I-N-D. And she capitalizes that when you see it in here, and that's helpful because if understanding your, your 
creator, who is God, who is spirit, who is divine mind, that will help you to understand then you yourself. Now this, this mind, this spirit, who is God, is just everywhere present. There are no locations where God is not. The spirit who is God is absolutely good. Just absolutely good. There's, God is not a mixture of good and evil in any way. Now, I've got a, a couple of things that are helpful when it comes to understanding God. Jesus said that, that God is a spirit. Like produces like. And, and a God who is spirit is going to produce a creation, that's you and me, who is completely spiritual. Now, spiritual, when I say that, one thing that helps me to understand my spiritual nature, I think of myself as the thought of God. The thought of God. Now, here you are sitting in those chairs, or at least 10 to the minus 8th meters above the chairs. You're sitting there, actually, as the evidence of divine spirit's presence. God is not something that's just a, a Bible thing or a Sunday thing. God is present everywhere, present in every corner of your thought. And the outcome, the offspring of God, this, uh, the offspring of spirit, is going to be entirely spiritual. Now, how can you tell? How can you tell that God is your creator? How could you tell that God is actually here and you're the evidence of God? Well, you remember how I just told you the, uh, the healing I had with my hand. There was evidence of something else going on, much more than met, met the eye. There on the grass, I realized that there's a substance to reality that goes beyond just atomic forces. Now, how can you detect God-likeness in yourself? How can you find that? Well, I told you a few minutes ago how I was, uh, I patted a dog on the way in here. I've got a, I've got a friend who, um, he told me something funny the other day. He said that uh, he, when he's on the freeway, he doesn't like going really fast. Now, in New Mexico, there, we have a lot of freeways, and the speed limit's 75. And he says, I don't like to go 75. Sometimes I just go 65, even less. And he said, you know what, I, what happens is, even though I'm in the far right lane, he, the cars come up behind me, he says, and uh, they just slam on the brakes and honk and honk. They're just so mad. He says, I have a, a, a dog. It was a, I don't know what breed it was. I think it was a lot of breeds. And um, she, he said, what I do is I have rolled down the window right behind the driver's seat. And my dog likes to put his head out the window. And those cars coming up behind me, they honk and get so mad. But as soon as they start to pass me and see that dog with his tongue out laughing and driving down the freeway with, with me, then at that point, they look in my window and wave and say hi, because that dog just melted all that anger. Well, you know, a dog looks like it's just a big conglomeration of atoms, yet uh, the, the natural joy and quick love a, a dog has for people, well, joy and love are not atomic. They aren't, they aren't things that you can weigh or smell, but you sure can feel them, and those people on the freeway feel them over and over again. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is a God-likeness to a dog, joy, immediate love. You ever step on a dog's toe? And how it might yelp, looks up at you, and forgives you immediately. You ever see that? What if people could forgive just half as good as a dog? Well, forgiveness, love, joy, those indicate the presence of God expressed in that dog. And the qualities of God 
are in each one of us here too. Those qualities indicate there's much more to you than, that, than meets the eye. All right, so I mentioned God is spirit. God is completely good. God is ever-present. God is the only power. All right, let's think about this then together. Think about a friend of yours, a friend you really like, one of your good friends. And think about maybe a quality of God that you love in your friend. Something that is non-physical, but indicates the presence, the presence of God. All right, think of that friend right now. All right, what's one of the qualities? It's going to be something way beyond height and weight. It's going to be actually a godlike quality. Tell me one of, one of your... Humor. Humor. you got a humorous friend. And that, that humor you're talking about, uh, that's a tough one. Because it's really easy to, uh, to be anything but, but humorous. But humor, uh, that shows great confidence if you can laugh, especially laugh at yourself. You're humble enough. That clearly is a godlike quality, certainly. What was the one you said? Trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. All right, well, now that's a rare one where you can actually trust your friend, a friend who really has your back. I mean, there's a lot of people we know, and we're acquainted with them, and it's, on the surface it looks like they're really rooting for us, but there's a few of our friends who are trustworthy, trustworthy to the degree where they have your back and they really are, they are rooting for you all the way. They're, they're trustworthy. Those people are rare. That is another quality of God. That loyalty, oh my goodness. Say it one. Devotion. Devotion. Oh, I love that. Devotion. It's so easy to, um, to abandon your friend or your, your world when things get tough. But to be devoted, devoted to being godlike, even when things are hard. Well, that's, that's a good example. Any other ones that you think? Pardon? The kindness of your friend. Why do you like that one? Makes me feel good. Yeah, she said, it makes me feel good. I know. Yeah, you know, yesterday I was uh, changing planes in Seattle, come down here to Portland, and um, I was pulling my bag, just like you've seen them all at the airport doing that, and um, there was a woman who held a door open to me, because I was getting on a little plane, held a door open for me to walk through. And I made a point of really acknowledging what she did for me. And I said, oh, th thank you, because she didn't have to be kind. And you should have seen her glowing. It turned out we ended up sitting right next to each other on the plane. And she's still staring at her knees, just glowing. Just felt so good. That kindness, oh, it's a quality of God. All right, now let's go a further. Let's, how about your, yourself? You yourself. Remember, you represent God's qualities. So the ones we've been talking about, kindness, joy, trustworthiness, devotion, all of those actually are qualities of God right here in this room. We each have the privilege of showing forth each of those qualities. We're the stage on which those qualities are shown. All right, so let's think about, think about you personally, you yourself, what's a quality of God that's showing in you? Now, don't worry, you're not bragging. These are God's qualities. So, what's one, what's one that's showing in you? Patience. Patience, you said? Oh, my goodness. Patience. I'm going to sit by you next. I need a big helping of it. I want that. <laughs> you know, that patience, that's just so much it's so easy to say, oh, I want to be more patient. I want to be more patient. But it's easy to just talk about it. And we might be patient for a few, few seconds, but it's so easy to slip. Now, what's another one? Let's think about it. I'll keep going. But. Unselfishness. Unselfishness. Oh, my goodness. Unselfishness. Another rare one. 
You know, so often the love we show one another is conditional. We'll love, some, we'll show love to somebody, but it's to get something, or maybe to, to uh, make them behave a certain way, something like that. But to be unselfish, unselfish love, just, you're just loving to do it. It's like playing catch with a ball. You don't keep score. You just play catch. You just throw that love back and forth, back and forth, just because you're doing it. That kind of unselfishness, that's another person I want to sit by, right? Or by her. What's another one? Gratitude. Gratitude, you said? Oh. Gratitude. Oh, it's, that's one of the strengths. It's such a, it's a weapon. It really is. Gratitude. You know, you can't feel anger and gratitude at the same moment. Gratitude, it's a quality of God. Anger or feeling of injustice or lack, those are thoughts of just mankind. Now, one thing you've noticed as we've been talking about this, um, I'm just so impressed with seeing people live out the qualities of God. You know, we could make a paper list of all the qualities we've all talked about here today. We could make a list of them on paper, fold them up, and put it in our pockets. But that wouldn't mean that they are in our actions, you know? This woman who I mentioned, person who wrote Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy, she said, we have it only as we live it. Oh, I think about that every week. We have these qualities, these qualities of God, only as we're actually living them, showing them forth, acting on them, letting them color our outlook and our attitude, and they show in our lives. When they show in our lives, our God-likeness is showing. And then you begin to see there's much more to you than just meets the eye. The spiritual qualities of God, once just, we've just talked about a few, those qualities indicate that your substance is so much more than physicality. Your substance is actually God. It's divine spirit. Isn't it interesting? Look at everybody in the room. You on the camera, you're just seeing the backs of their heads, but everybody in the room, we're all so different. Look at how different we each are. We are all expressing this same single God, yet we're all so different. And the reason why is because there's one God. God expresses himself in ones. So you have, as God's creation, all of the qualities of God available to you. Yet, just like musical notes on a piano, each one is played a little different in, in, uh, in you and me. You know, the other day I was, um, I was in a museum and I was looking at a, at a painting and it was, a, it was a Monet painting, you know, by Claude Monet. And um, it was interesting to look at it. And, you know, he, he had painted this same scene in a lot of different ways. But, you know, as I was looking at the painting, I, I realized I wasn't really looking at the, the atomic elements that made up the colors of paint and the canvas. Even though I'd never met Claude Monet, I was standing there and looking at his thought. That painting represented what he was thinking at the time, his impression of his world. Well, you know what? Every one of us, each one of us, we represent the thought of God in a very individual way. You are the, the spiritual painting, you could say, of God, completely unique, yet showing forth the, the thought of God, the beauty of God. Now, the reason I'm kind of going into this so strongly is because when you begin to recognize and acknowledge your God-likeness, in other words, these qualities of God that are glowing in you, as you begin to acknowledge them, recognize them, even though the rest of the world isn't, you're doing it, it has a healing effect. 
It has a healing effect. When you're praying and you recognize your spirituality like that and you see it practically in the qualities of God you're showing forth, it has a, a change of thought for you. It, it brings a change of thought and it heals. I'll give you an example. I was talking with those people at that table about horses before the lecture and we have four horses. There's, there's one particular horse we own. I just, I just love her. She's just the, oh, she's great. She's a, a leopard Appaloosa, which is a, looks like a Dalmatian. That's the best way I could describe it. Uh, most of the time, Appaloosas aren't that big, but this one, she is just huge. She's really big. But she's a teddy bear. She's just, I just love her. She's so sweet. Well, she's always very careful of my space. You know, I'm just a little person, and she's a big old 1,800-pound horse. A um, while back, I was in her stall. I was going to move her out into a corral we have where we live, and um, I was putting on a halter so that I could move her out, and I wasn't paying attention, really, to what I was doing, and inadvertently, she walked right on my foot. Now, her head, I remember, her head was right here by my face, and when she walked on my foot, she knew she did it, I yelled out really loud. And you know, most of the time when a horse hears a loud noise, especially right by their head, they really shy away. Not this one. She, she knew she walked on my foot. I yelled out. She did not even budge. And I, somehow I walked her out into the corral. And um, I remember I was so surprised. You know, if I had hurt her, I would have spent a long time telling her how sorry I am. I'm so sorry. Oh, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. She didn't even do that. <laughs> Nothing going on there. I mean, you know, horses, they kick each other sometimes. And I watched them now, after, especially after that experience. They don't spend a lot of time saying, I'm sorry. They just move on real quick. And that's what she was doing. And I'm standing there. I take her halter off. Here I am talking so normally like, oh, it's no big deal, just walked on my foot. I didn't think I could even think it was hurting so bad. It was really hurting. I was just wearing these dumb little rubber boots. And um, so she's standing right there next to me. No, I'm sorry, but let's go. Well, I, I, it sure seemed like my substance was essentially and exclusively atomic. My foot was just matter, nerves, and bones, and all that kind of stuff. And that was me, because it sure hurt. And so that felt like it was, it was definitely me. And when the horse walked on my foot, it didn't feel like it had walked 10 to the minus 8th meters above my foot. <laughs> it felt like it walked right on it. All right. Well, there I am. You can picture all of this. And um, here I'm very art articulate describing it, but ugh. at the time... I remember I thought, oh, I, I, I'm going to pray. And um, here I am. I'm, I'm praying along. I prayed by listening. That's what I did. I, didn't, I, I couldn't talk. I just prayed by listening. And as, as I prayed, something interesting happened. Uh, in this case, God answered my prayer in the form of an idea, uh, an idea that I had read previously in this book, Science and Health, I'd been telling you about. It doesn't always happen that way for me, but in this case it did. Now, what, uh, what came to me, something I knew very well, and it, it seems sort of trite, I know it so well, but here I am, I'm praying, I'm wide open, I'm not saying a word to God, I'm just open, listening, and here's the, here's the line out of Science and Health that um, I hear. It's when an accident happens, you think or exclaim, I'm hurt. Your thought is more powerful than your words, more powerful than the, the accident itself to make the, the injury real. Well, that's exactly what I'd done. I am hurt, as that was my thought, certainly. Well, I took my phone out, and um, I wanted to look up what comes after those lines in Science and Health. Science and Health is online. You can, you can look it up that way. And so I found the rest of the quote. I got it written down here. Mary Baker Eddy, she gives some instructions when you're in trouble like I was there in the corral with that sweet little Appaloosa, little. She says, now reverse the process. Declare that you're not hurt 
and understand the reason why, and you will find the ensuing good effects to be in exact proportion to your disbelief in physics and your fidelity to divine metaphysics, confident in God as all, which the scriptures declare him to be. All right, she says, now reverse the process, she says. Okay, that's the first step. She says, your basis is that God is all. Okay, well, that's pretty different. All right, so what I decided to do, standing there in the, in the corral, mentally I reversed the whole process. You know when you play a film backwards? I just played the whole event backwards from the time I'm standing there in the corral with my horse all the way to when it walked on me. And then um, I noticed, I thought, I, I realized, I think God showed it to me, that in every step, as I reversed it, in every step, at every point, I still remained the idea of God. Remember how I said that to, one way to think of yourself as spiritual is to embrace the idea that you're God's thought. And as God's thought, my substance was very different than matter. And as I reversed the process, I saw in each step, I'm God's thought all the way through. All right, you picture me there in the New Mexico sun, having this all happen there, the horses next to me, and then... Immediately, the pain stopped. I mean, immediately. And I just walked around, normally doing some chores in the, in the barn and in that corral, and my horse looked at me like, so? <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, again, I had that stunned feeling that the rules of materiality certainly did not work as... I'd been trained to believe they should. Here I am walked on by an 1800 pound horse, but in the recognition that my spiritual substance, the quality of, of wholeness as a thought of God could not be walked on. That acknowledgement healed me. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here. As you begin to recognize the spiritual ideas, the qualities of God in you, you will see that they actually are invulnerable. Nothing can change them. Nothing can dilute them. You don't have to get more of them. They can't age out of you. The qualities of God are present. Right there, where it seemed like there was injury and dislocation or whatever it was, right there where that seemed to be, actually was the wholeness of God expressed in me. God couldn't be walked on. Neither could God's idea. Just a, I mean, here I am talking about it as if I really got it all at that moment. I really didn't, but it doesn't take much. The truth battles for you. It does. And as you begin to recognize the truth of God's presence in you in so many different ways, it has a healing effect. And it's kind of beautiful how that happens. Did you notice that when I was praying there in that corral, did you notice how I didn't do the talking? I didn't come up with words for my prayer. I didn't do it that way. No, I told you I listened. Now, what this is leading to is a beautiful thing. When you're in trouble, when it sure appears that your substance is either material or tied to matter or dependent on matter, the beauty of it all is that you don't have to make it some sort of an intellectual exercise and think yourself out of it. Now, you go to God, just like I did there in the corral. You have the right to go to God for just a better model, a better model of things. This better model we're seeing is based on spiritual qualities showing in you. That better model, it's beautiful how that works. Going to God for help this way is something that I not only do every day, I've made it the, the main basis of my life. 
I really live to do that. Now, for, you of the, for those of you who are watching online, I've got an, another lecture. It's, it's on YouTube if you look it up. It's called The Healing Effect of Your Prayers. And in that lecture, I'll talk all about how specifically God will answer your prayers. There's lots of different ways it happens, and there's a whole other lecture on that. And if you want to, after this one, uh, you can look at it. It's up to you. But um, it's beautiful how that works, how you can go to God for help and get a better model of, of life, of things. Mary Baker Eddy, she talks about that model, getting a better model here. This is in Science and Health. She says, we must form perfect models in thought and look at them continually, or we'll never carve them out in grand and noble lives. Let unselfishness, goodness, mercy, justice, health, holiness, love, the kingdom of heaven reign within us, and sin, disease, and death will diminish until they finally disappear. All right, you can see that's the basis of our work here today. I'll read it again. You notice that those qualities, those spiritual qualities she's saying to, to begin to focus on, that, let that be your model for thought. We must form perfect models in thought and look at them continually, or we'll she'll never carve them out in grand and noble lives. Let unselfishness, goodness, mercy, justice, health, holiness, love, it's the kingdom of heaven. She says, let them reign within you. And what happens if you do? Sin, disease, and death diminish until they finally disappear from your experience. And so that is why it's worth it to live these ideas. We have them only as we, we live them. Now, you can tell I'm, I'm really encouraging you to recognize your God-likeness, especially in the face of what the five physical senses say about you personally. Um, when you go to God for help, like we're talking about, when you go to God for help and God gives you a better model, like he did for me in the, in the corral. He gave me a better model. It turns out that my substance, as God's thought, could not be walked on. I now had a better model, and that model had God behind it. And that's why it transformed my thought, my whole experience. Um, when you get that better model, I think it's worth it really to stick with it. Really to stay there. I just want to say, see, God and the power of prayer, what it does, it does not improve imperfect material substance. That is not what we're doing. Prayer does not improve imperfect material substance. It actually proves the presence of perfect spiritual substance. Does that make sense a little bit? We're not getting a better model of matter. We're getting a better model of reality. That's what we're hap what's happening when we're praying. All right. So let's say you go to God, just like I did in the corral. Here I was. I didn't even think I could think. But yes, God got through that too. And when you're praying and God gives you a better model and you begin to recognize your God-likeness, the qualities of God that are in place right there where it seems materiality is confronting and threatening you, where you see that actually the presence of God and the qualities of God are there in you. When you get there, get that better model, stick with it. When you get to a good place in thought, stay there. It's easier said than done. That's work to do that. You know, as I was driving down Highway 5 here, I saw that there's a, right on the freeway, there's a baseball stadium. It looks like single A stadium, or is it independent? Single A? Yeah, what team is it affiliated with? Giants. It's a Giants one. Oh, yeah, that's Giants here. Um, okay, when I used to be a baseball player, I remember uh, how uh, before a game, before a game started, I would uh, maybe have practice, batting practice before the game. You can see I'm not very tall. I was a position player. I wasn't a pitcher. And um, so I would work on really getting a good, clear model of the correct mechanics for hitting. I might do that before a game. And then I might have batting practice, and I'd practice these good mechanics so that I'm actually living them, not just knowing them. Well, then uh, when the game starts, I remember, I might be in the on-deck circle on one knee, watching the pitcher and watching the hitter who's hitting right now. And at that point, I might do it again. I might 
think again, get real clear on the good model for hitting, maybe one swing idea that I'm going to use that, that night or something like that. Then uh, the announcer calls my name. I walk up and stand in the batter's box. At that point, I remember I would do it again. As the pitcher began to wind up, oh, I would get so calm so that the model of good hitting was really clear in my thought. And the first pitch would go by, and it's there. Oh, I got it. That was good. I got that idea. Really good. Then I have to step out of the batter's box, look down at the third base coach. He may give me some signals, signals that mean something, or maybe they don't. I hear the crowd hollering out. The guy might be playing the organ up there. I might not have liked the call the umpire had. Well, by the second pitch, that model might not be as clear. Now, when you talk to a person whose business it is to play baseball, it's different. They're doing it for fun, certainly. But you know, you're getting paid for this, and so you really are trying to do it right. And uh, you talk to one of them, they'll tell you that having that good model of thought, they can do it maybe for the first one or two pitches, but anything beyond four or five, that's, that's a real victory. You'll see those guys, it drives you crazy, doesn't it, when they step out of the box and they readjust their batting gloves and they do it for the hundredth time, what they're doing is resetting, trying to get that model back, and that's their way of setting up again, and they use that as a, as a cue. Well, praying is like that too. Praying is just like that. Yes, let's say God blesses you with a beautiful idea, like the one he gave me there in the corral, where he showed me that, you know what? Play it forward or backwards, doesn't really matter. Your substance is that of my thought, God showed me. And that, that substance of thought is invulnerable. Well, when God gives you some good idea like that, then it feels good to stick with it. Stay with it as as long as you can. Now, if you only get through one pitch, let's say you're able to do it for 10 seconds, I'll tell you this is true. Throw confetti in the air. I mean it. You want to rejoice in that. Because I tell you, you know, you might be able to do it for 20 seconds tomorrow. It is very important. See, I've traveled around, been to so many different countries, met so many different people. And so often I meet people who are introduced to the Bible maybe even Science and Health, the book I've been telling you about. And the more they learn about God, the more they learn about the law of God and the goodness of God, it turns out the worse they feel, the more guilty they feel. They learn all kinds of things about God. They read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, all kinds of things about human behavior. And uh, they feel horrible. It just helps them identify what they're doing wrong. That's not why Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. I know for me, I've never once had anybody say to me, Mark, once I really started feeling guilty, I was healed. No one ever says that. Those ideas like in the Sermon on the Mount, all these ideas about the nature of an essence of God, they're all there to help us identify specifically what we're doing right and the qualities of God that are showing in us. That's what that's all there for. So study it so that when you catch yourself expressing a quality of God, like meekness, Jesus talks about in the, in the Beatitudes, when you, when you express that, throw confetti in the air. Acknowledge it. Try this. Try it for six months. If you don't like that, after six months, go back to the destructive self-criticism. See if that will do it. <laughs> but I promise you, once you begin watching for what you do right, watching for the qualities of God showing in you, once you start doing that, you'll improve spiritually much quicker. Watch how it works. Te experiment with this. It is a, it's a wonderful thing. When God gives you a better model, stick to it. However long you get, 10 seconds, two pitches, maybe three, maybe 12. Whatever it is, you, will, uh, you should rejoice. What will help you stick is your love for God. So we work, it always works that way. To the degree you love God, will you hold to what God tells you? Just goes hand in hand that way.
Now, as I've been talking about all of this so far, is there anybody here to think about a question that you might want to ask? You think, well, you know, I'd like to ask him this after we're done. Anything? Anybody? Tell me. No. Um, so you talked about, you know, your recent science healing. I'm trying to write out a, a, a book. I've gone through graphs, 2,000, 1,000 pages. So in healing, you have an epiphany that heals the situation. Yes. In a book, you need continual epiphanies. Otherwise, the quality of the book is going to go down. So sure. How do you maintain that? OK, that's a good question. He's an, you're an author, and you're writing a book. And you want to not just have one good idea in all the pages of your book, but you want to kind of keep it going. And so you're thinking about how would what I'm talking about apply to your work as an author. And that consistency of inspiration is actually a hallmark of God. Inspiration is a quality of God. It's so good. It's not, it doesn't have to come from the author. You reflect it. You know how the, the moon, it doesn't create any of its own light. It just reflects the sun's light. And you and I, we couldn't uh, create our own inspiration. We reflect the inspiration of God. And you know what that feels like when you're writing and you are writing some ideas in your book and you didn't even know you knew them and they're so good. Well, that's inspiration. That's a quality of God. But what's beautiful about this is that God doesn't change. So the consistency of inspiration is also something that should show in your book. So how do you make that happen? Do you have to clench your fists and grit your teeth and say, my, con my, my inspiration is going to be consistent today? Uh, no, no. You're only here as the effect of God, not the cause. And your book will do much more for people as you kind of are brave enough to step back and let the mind that is God, that is divine spirit, show in everything you do with your book. Not just in writing it, but in producing it, placing it in, peop in people's hands or however you're going to do that. Let it be all uh, the whole experience, a holy thing where you're just looking for the evidence of God in every step. Now, I'm probably confirming something you already kind of knew deep inside. And everybody in this room, we're now all rooting for you. And we're going to root for you. Well, you got a lot of customers, too. Um, but uh, we're all rooting for you because we know that the consistency of inspiration, it's such an important idea. You know, so many people would tell you, oh, yeah, I had great inspiration, you know, 30 years ago, but not today. That would have to be true about God. Because, see, we're just expressions of God, not ourselves. The and consistency of inspiration ties into the consistency of uh, humility. That's, isn't that good? He said... The consistency of inspiration is tied to the consistency of humility. That's, real, that's, that's a, one of those times you throw confetti in the air. That's so good. God gave you that. Now, God gave you that as your blessing. Put that on the front cover, you know, the little frontest page of your book, because that should be the theme song of the whole experience. I'll hold it there, too. I love that. Thank you. That's perfect. That's good. Anyone else? Good. Oh, yeah. Talk about healing. The healing is derived from realizing uh, the spiritual reality versus the material reality, and that was very clear. Yeah. Um, how do you appreciate the physical manifestation of healing that takes place after that change of thought, without dwelling on that physical manifestation that so often comes through that change of thought? Certainly. Okay. He, that's an important question he just asked. He asked. When you're praying and uh, you have this change of thought we're talking about, you, you have a change of perspective on how you see yourself, and it all comes through the power of God, um, how are you not almost distracted, I guess you could say, by the physical change that you, you see or experience? You know, I think a lot of times the first uh, experience somebody has that way uh, it is distracting. Remember me on the, the grass after my dad shut my hand in the door? I, I'm going, what in the world? You know, how could this be? But after that, I knew then I had to go further each time, further into spirituality. Now, 
best way I could say it is this. If you were, if you were having a dream, you were having a dream that, um, oh, I don't know, you, were, uh, you found some buried treasure or something like that. Um, you might be feeling really good in your dream, and then you, uh, you find the treasure, you find that buried treasure. Um, you know that the treasure in your dream is only a symbol for how you're feeling really good. You know what I mean? And if you were scared that day, let's say, you might have dreamt that you were going down the uh, drain of a swimming pool or something like that. You know what I mean? And you'd have symbolized it that way. So when you're awake, it's easy to see the treasure was uh, just a symbol for how you were feeling, you know, a good feeling. Now, you know, we'll take the analogy further because this is a really good point you made. Sometimes uh, it's said that uh, when pirates <laughs> would bury treasure, when they'd have a big treasure chest, they would dig a very deep hole, bury the treasure very down, down very deep. Then they would fill the hole up halfway. And then on top of that sand, they would just put a little baby treasure chest. Put that in there. And then cover the whole thing up. Make the treasure map. All right? When, uh, if somebody happened to find that treasure map, and they didn't want, you know, that to happen, but somebody, let's just say somebody got their hands on it, they'd follow the map to the spot, dig down, and all they'd get was that little treasure, and they'd think that's the whole thing. But deeper down is where the big treasure lies. And so, sure, the beauty of painlessness out in the corral, you know, where my foot didn't hurt, I think that's great. But the real treasure of the day is that I'm the thought of God. That's the deep treasure. And that's why I want to bring that out to each of you, too that the qualities, the nature of God, the essence of God that's showing in you moment by moment, that spirituality is the real story of each, of each one of you, and it's the real treasure, it's the real value. Don't be distracted by just physicality. I learned not too long ago about uh, a man, he was a, a, he was a teacher, a chemistry teacher at a college. He was very well respected. He'd gotten his bachelor's degree at MIT, his um, master's at Caltech, and his um, doctorate at University of Illinois, then he was a teacher. And one day, he was doing uh, an experiment in his laboratory, an experiment where he had to melt some potassium cyanide. And um, potassium cyanide has a very high melting point, and so he was melting it in a metal dish stirring it with a glass rod. He placed the glass rod on the, kind of balanced it on the dish and then looked at his notes for what he's supposed to do next in his experiment. Then he reached up to touch the rad, rod but picked up the wrong end. Not only did it burn his hand, he had the cyanide crystals, you know, in his hand. Being a chemist, a teacher to, with that kind of knowledge, he knew that he shouldn't have long to live. He, too, was a student of these two books I've been telling you about. He, too, was a student of, of the Bible and science and health. And he, he said that he was fearless. Now, that sounds surprising, wouldn't it? That he would have no fear at all. He had learned something from Mary Baker Eddy, where she encourages readers to look deep into realism instead of accepting only the outward sense of things. Look deep into realism. And that's what he did. His prayer was a deep look, and it doesn't say much about what God told him, yet within three days there was no evidence of any kind of cyanide poisoning. Even though he'd seen the crystals in his hand, there was no evidence of it, and by the end of the week there wasn't even a burn. Again, you know, substance is not just what we read about in, in, in books or learn about in school. It's books like these <laughs> that can give us, a, give us a hint of what's more, of more that's happening. I was reading not too long ago about Clara Barton and something that she says about Mary Baker Eddy. I've got it here on a, a little piece of paper. She says this, she, Clara Barton, she's who founded the American Red Cross. She says, 
while I have not studied deeply enough the great religion founded by Mrs. Eddy to consider myself a Christian scientist, I can say that I look upon Christian science, as I understand it, as the most ideally beautiful, yet most practical and comforting of beliefs. It is doing more in the world today, and will continue to, as more people become cognizant of the beauty of its teachings than any other one influence for good. Mrs. Eddy should have the respect, admiration, and love of the whole nation, for she is its greatest woman. You know, I, I would agree. <laughs> you could tell from uh, the things I've been telling you here today, the, the ideas that I've gleaned from her book, Science and Health, have helped me to no degree. Here in an hour, we can talk something about contrast the substance of matter with spirit, that kind of thing. In these books, the Bible and Science and Health, you will find so much more. And I know on the way out, there are copies, both of the Bible, Science and Health, and some other things there on that table if you, if you want copies. But we're not done yet here. But it's worth it to do that. If you would like to learn more about Mary Baker Eddy, and I, I really suggest you, that you do learn more about her character. It'll help you pray. Um, go, to, go online to the Mary Baker Eddy Library. Just do a search, Mary Baker Eddy Library, and that is a wonderful place to learn about, about her life, about her healing work, about the development of her ideas, and as you see how she moved forward after learning about healing from Jesus' example, it will help you in your work moving forward that same way. The Mary Baker Eddy Library, it's, it's, worth, it's worth seeing. Has it been helpful for you to realize that a recognition of spiritual substance in you and as you, how that heals? Is that something you feel you'll be able to to use as you leave from here? Yes. Good. Whatever seems to threaten you physically, see, whatever, whatever appears to threaten you, it always appears one way or another as imperfect material substance, one way or another. And remember, prayer goes so far beyond that. We're not here to improve imperfect material substance. We're here to reveal the presence of perfect spiritual substance. It's what's here. So, when you all are alone tonight or today thinking about this lecture, you're praying for yourself, you're thinking about applying these things, these ideas to your own life, start now with God. Start now with the substance that is real, that is God. Start there. You don't have to start with matter anymore. Stop battling matter. You don't have to battle matter. You don't have to fight it. Stop fighting matter. Stop trying to get more of matter. Accumulate it. Matter is not the story. No, what we're interested in is the spiritual ideas of God, present, substantial, glowing in each one of you and in you yourself, okay? All right, let's go back to that first line I quoted there on 349 and see how far we've come here today. Here Mary Baker Eddy says, in Christian science, substance is understood to be spirit, while the opponents of Christian science believe substance to be matter. They think of matter as something and almost the only thing, and of the things which pertain to spirit as next to nothing or as very far removed from daily experience. Christian science takes exactly the opposite view. All right, Christian science takes that view, and now I can see each one of you have taken that view too. You all have that view, that spirit is all. Spirit is your substance. You take that view, take it from here, will you? You know I will. All right, we're all done. That's good. <laughs> <laughs>